It's late February here in New England and we're tired of winter, starting to dream about summer and sitting by the lake in an Adirondack chair. But what if it was the perfect chair, the ultimate Adirondack chair? Well, I wanna share with you tonight one that I designed some time ago and you might feel excited to make for yourself anticipating summer. If you wanna see that, stick around. Let's just check it out. I've got one sitting right here up on the bench and you can see right away it's a little different from your average Adirondack chair. It's built for comfort really and also it has kind of a modern design really determined by this curved side rail. We're all used to seeing the Adirondack chairs they had that you know, they usually have that big, wide, bulky side rail that has the curve of the seat and then it goes down straight and the slats are sitting on top of that curve on the seat and all the parts are kind of three quarter inch. And then back here, I can't remember how it's joined in the back here, but um, it's kind of funky. But anyway, I wanted to give this a little more of a contemporary look, a slope, but mainly I was thinking about the comfort. So the first thing in designing for comfort was to sit in a bunch of Adirondacks. I just snuck around town and sat in Adirondacks sitting out by the Shaker Village out all around there and various neighbors as I took my morning walks. And I would sit in their little Adirondacks they would have sitting out in front of and, and check them out. So I combined some of the elements and got the basic uh, measurements for some of the heights and things and then brought it all together for this final design. Now you notice with this chair, you can see on the seat, it's got kind of a deep curve. So the seat has this high point here and then it slopes deeply down. There's like a four inch drop, as I recall, from here to here. Plus we're pretty close to the ground actually with the back of that seat. It's really only about nine, nine inches, nine to 10 inches off the ground back here. And then we're up, we're up at 14 here. So yeah, it's a good four to five inch drop toward the back. So it's kind of a low rider. And that's the thing about Adirondacks that I love. You chill out in them. You know, you wanna relax and be comfortable. <laughs> but why not have it be a little more curvilicious to support you and make you feel all that more comfortable? So we've got that in the seat. Now, another aspect is the backrest. So with the backrest, I've got a double curve going on here. The most obvious is this lumbar support with the slats. A lot of Adirondacks, especially the less expensive, bang it out type, have just straight slats in the back. And that's fine. And it's flat across, but you know, limited in its comfort potential, right? But this one, we've got this curved lower lumbar support. And that I've got on a pattern, this curvature, came off of our old Grand Caravan minivan. I used to sit in that and, you know, when you've got kids and you're thinking, man, this is gonna be a long trip, you wanna be comfortable. <laughs> and the, the chair I noticed was not as, you know, sofa-like to the, the cars I grew up with. You know, some of the older cars, the Chrysler Newports, some of you remember those big benchy seats, and they were like indoor upholstery. They were all sprung and everything. But this modern, uh, more modern Chrysler uh, Grand Caravan had more of a molded seat, like most of the modern ones. And I was thinking, man, they must have really researched to get this molded seat so comfortable because I can sit in this for a long time. So I actually sketched off the, the curve of that Grand Caravan. And that's what we put in this seat. So whenever I sit in this, Adirondack, I not only relax, but I feel like taking a drive. 
<laughs> no, actually. <laughs> You've got that lower lumbar support, but you know what makes the ultimate comfort in a chair? It's not only that really nice recline and, and curvature supporting your back, but it's this curve that also wraps around. So you can notice these slats actually curve this way as well. So they're really cupping your lower back and your upper back as you sit in there. So you can see from the back how nicely cut out and curved that support is and at the bottom there. So that curvature establishes a great kind of wrap around your body. Here's, here's the actual curve. That's the amount of curve around the front edge of this back rail. And these templates were made right off the drawing, which you're probably going to ask, someone's going to ask, can I build that chair? Why, yes, you can. It's your lucky day. <laughs> but stick around at the end. We, we don't have any special deals. I'm not, I just really wanted to share the chair primarily here. But one other template I wanted to show you was this one here first. This is the curvature for the seat slats. Okay, so this was the amount of sweep and curve I wanted to have. Uh, so it rises up under your thighs there and you sit right down low into this swoop right there. And then, but rather than the slats sitting on top of the side rail, this is the template for the side rail. So you have, we run a groove this is a channel for a 5 8 guide collar. We plunge with a half inch bit. So we end up with a half inch groove into that side. And then into that, we have all these slats that have a good heavy tongue on there and they fit into the groove. Now that's 5 8 so that's not gonna work right there. But this is an actual leg where you can see how this joinery is different. And this gives it kind of that sleek, more modern look. So these slide in there and these get all assembled when it gets glued up. They just go in and you space them appropriately all the way down. And by just spacing them around, they follow and make that sweet curvature on the side. These other slots you see are actually for floating tenons for the front rail and the back rail. Cross, crossing the piece. And the leg itself has a big, a big dado cut out that laps over the top, laps right over the leg like that. So you get this nice heavy lap joint and it's screwed in from inside, screwed and glued. And I even put screws down in there so you'd never see them. And that's really rock solid all waterproof glue and all that. Really fun one to make. So Tom, it's noticed that this is probably Cypress, right? Yes, very one, good Cypress. eye, yeah. Uh, what does one do if they don't have that material available to them where they live? Well, you, there are other water resistant woods out there. Um, if you have mahogany, <laughs> that's probably less uh, available and expensive. The genuine is actually quite good, but what is it? It's like twelve to fifteen dollars a board foot. Um, but <laughs> is that all? You know, another one that is really more affordable. It, you can find it in a lot of places around. Is white oak, but that's kind of heavy. I believe locust. It's hard to find a, a perfect cedar. It seems like all those really water resistant woods are either harder to find in your area or they're expensive for where they are. But um, really, uh, this cypress is great, especially if you can get it like in a dense form. Now, some of the processes of making this chair and designing it um, were to, that were more complex were making all these slats. If you notice all these slats, can you see? This, this got coated with some weather sealer it wasn't me it was a um, someone who had it for a little while and this has 
stripey, stringy kind of quarter sawn grain all the way across. And the way we achieved that was just by getting a thicker eight quarter plank pretty wide and sawing these out consecutively. I wanna show you really quick a sweet little jig. I know some of you have seen this, but this is a jig and a technique that is really fun to use and great use of material and it gives you this more harmonious result of quarter sawn grain. And it's using a pivot point on the bandsaw. So let me show you what that is. Uh, we're noticing that one of the slats is a little bit uh, off there. Is that oh, happening is for sure? Wow, a picky. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, I don't know. It's just doing its thing. Maybe it's this one. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, the, it's been around a while, so poor craftsmanship. <laughs> no, these are, up, these are up in the air a little bit. I didn't put a, you could put another brace up here, but that's one of the features of this chair. I'll show you at the end when I get to sit in it. When you sit back, you're supported and you have that good, you have that good lower lumbar support, this bar here is really solid. But up here, there's kind of a, there's a little, see the, there's a spring to these. And collectively, when you sit back, you'll, they almost form fit to your upper back and you can feel like a little spring. And that, I really like that. So rather than putting a bar on there that would kind of rigidize that a bit, I thought it'd be fun just to let it float in space. And then of course, you run the risk of wood doing what it wants yeah, to do. Yeah, that was a question Mike had, if it would work to add across the port, across the back to keep that, those slats. Yeah, yeah, it's optional. You yeah. sure you sure could. All right, so let me show you this. Um, this is the bandsaw, and I've got a pivot point set up on here. It's simply a block of wood that has a 90 degree angle here, but it presents as like a 45, 45. So you're actually, your fence is this edge that's been dulled and it's been set up to be parallel or just in front of the teeth. Because what we do is we start with our piece against that push point. And when we make this feed, like let's pretend I'm against the point, I'm going to keep this surface as perpendicular to the push point. So at 90 degrees to the, that axis. So I'll be pushing and I'll be turning it like this, trying to keep it as best I can. And then when I get to this area here, now I'm gonna turn it back and just keep turning and following. Now I'm gonna be bearing against that push point. What that's gonna do is produce a parallel cut on a curved piece of material. And then what's great about that is your template, you can then cut another one. So I've already made this, this is actually the part of the curve for that um, Grand Caravan seat. And we're gonna get that on there and make this curve. I'll make a couple cuts, show you how fast it is. Now this is not as thick, just a sample piece, demonstrate the pivot point. All right, so see that, how fast and easy that is? And you can go right on across and get these very similar pieces. Now, after a couple shots, 
it's nice to clean up that edge again or to flush route to your pattern if you're getting off the pattern and then you can saw out a few more. But check those out, they're like identical. Thickness is the same and they have the same curvature to them. So that's a sweet method for sawing curves on the bandsaw in general. And then you also end up getting this nice harmonious linear grain right across the front. This is a little punky uh, white pine, but you get the idea. So that's what we did here on this chair as well. Now, what I wanna show you too is um, with the design, I was, the last choice I had to make after all the comfort, I had a mock-up that I built out of Poplar. And rather than pop that together, I'll just show you an, a piece of it that I was working with. And one of the big choices was what to do about the arms because I had this curve in the seat, but I started out, I had straight arms across here. They came right out flat in plain, like a lot of Adirondack chairs. And I thought, gosh, this is kind of like Edith Ann, you know, like I'm up in this chair and I've got a straight around. So this was from the mock-up. I did two versions. So let's just set this on top. It's gonna to be a little higher than normal, but you'll be able to see the, the difference. So a typical Adirondack has these straight arms. That's the classic. So when you sit in there, and let me, let me put it on the floor here. When we, when we do sit in here, See, your arms are up higher like that. You know, you, you always, when you're sitting in an Adirondack, they're just, they don't feel quite as good. So I thought, you know, it's a little more, it's a little trickier, a little more work to put this recline on the arm, but wouldn't it be nice because not only will it more, better conform to your arm, but, Design-wise, if you look at the profile, the arm approximates the slope of the curve. So it's a more attractive, appealing look. If you just had it in plain, it wouldn't, wouldn't look as nice in composition with the curved side rail. So now we've got this and we rest our arms in there and you are right in the pocket. I mean, it feels so much better. Plus, all of a sudden you feel like you have a drink holder right here on this little flat area too. So everything is good in your world. And you just <laughs> sit back here and spring away. Now I wanna show you one of the things, to, to make that arm, it's one of the more complex joints on the whole chair. So we get into it and we talk about this angle to make that slope. It actually wasn't too complicated because we just, this is a 12 degree slope. So what I have right in there is a spline. I don't know if you can see it, but it's like an inch and a half long and it's going into three quarter, three quarter. And you have that miter right there. That miter is six degrees. So the six on each side gives you the 12 of a slope there. And so then you have to cut that uh, groove for the spline perpendicular to the face of that miter. So that little flat right there, that, all you have to do is make sure that you cut your spline perpendicular, 90 degrees to the flat surface of that face, and you will have a perfect fitting miter. Now, here's the way it works with it disassembled. Here's the same joint, but Here's the material that I use for the spline. So you can see it's got the grain running this way. If I had it running the other way, I could break it easily. But when you run grain the long way like that, it's very tough. So it gets glued in and you don't wanna fit those too tight when you're fitting them because once you get the glue on there, everything gets tight. And then that gets glued in there 
and it's left over length and trimmed off after. And then you try to keep your arms in order so that you can have the grain just appear to flow right over the little drop there. So that's a nice method for achieving that joint. And that's a fun one to cut in the course. And then the other complex one is this big uh, bridle joint. It's kind of like an open, almost like an open mortise and tenon joint. And you can see this corner is glued up, but you have that big tenon and the uh, bridle side of the joint. And then when it's put together, like on this end, it gets glued in and clamped up and all that glue surface makes a tremendous strong joint. Then the whole thing, you, you put your template on there that has the curvature and you're gonna be sawing right across here to eliminate that and then have your arm. So you end up with the final appearance being like this. Isn't that nice? You got this really good, strong bridle joint. Just nice waterproof glue in there, holds it all together. Do you have to clamp that joint? How, how would you do that? Yeah, you do. You put some sandwich pressure here. It is different than a mortise and tenon because you have that open end. So to be sure that you're getting good solid adhesion, all you have to do is put like, I just put like little uh, hand screw clamps or any kind of clamp with a block, just to sandwich and get a good flat bite on that. And then all that glue surface will give tremendous strength to it. We do have, we mentioned a video course of doing it, and it's really a fun way of doing it. I think most people who've taken courses, they all try to say, what, what gives me a lot of gratification is knowing that it feels like I hoped it would feel like, like just being here, like us just being together in the shop and me sharing what Pugmore was so generous to share with me and a, a lot of things I've learned since about various styles and make, methods of making. So that's what we want, you to feel like you're a neighbor and that you came in, you stopped in and at epicwoodworking.com, you can also actually become a neighbor, move into the neighbor wood and you can get these courses, all the courses for like ridiculously little money per month. This is the drawing for this project. Look at that. This was back when I was shading some of them. Yeah. But look at that profile. So that's your template for your side and the cutout for the slot, the groove slot. And then on the other page, they're, they're actual size. So you make your arm template and all that from that side there. Pretty so fun. Tom, um, Mark's asking, um, or I think some of them are asking about how you finished this for the weather. Let's talk about that for a bit. How you what? How you finished the antibiotics for weather? Well, honestly, Mark, the very best thing you can do for the weather is paint them. I hate to say that, <laughs> but a good paint is going to hold up better than anything. Clear finishes, no matter what you do, they do degrade. Now there are some like epiphanes and others uh, that for bo the boating industry that are like two part finishes. They're almost like epoxies, but they'll hold up longer. But the UV rays of the sun, the weather, the heat, the water, they just wreak havoc on anything put outside. So I know of one company that in Europe that was importing all white oak things, and I've seen a lot of white oak furniture, and I was curious how they recommended to finish their stuff because it came in unfinished, and they recommended to keep it unfinished. Just let it gray out, because all wood, like outside, will get that kind of Cape Cod gray, and it actually doesn't hurt it, um, because it was wood that was made to take the weather better. Now, I've tried to do that with some things, and yeah, they gray out. You may not like that that much. I did put a spar varnish on an outdoor bench that was made out of white oak and it kind of degraded after less than two years. And you know what it is now? 
painted. I put it through a good book and I haven't had to touch it for like four years. So that's, that's really hard which, choice. Which because you really didn't want to do. Didn't I didn't want to paint it. I mean, you're going to have to just stay up on it. You can use uh, like deck treatments. You're just going to have to hit it every year or two. You know what I mean? So it's up to you. But you do maintain the look of the wood and the warmth. You're going to get little black streaks on there, but so what? That's how it is outside. If you paint it, if you plan it to paint, does the wood matter that much? Not as much, but yes, it matters. Um, one of the things I really recommend, I mean, think if you use white pine, it would not hold up great outside, especially if water starts wicking up through the end grain in the bottom of the legs. See under here? So you have end grain down here, and the grain is like all these tiny little drinking straws the water hits here and it just starts to rise up, you know, with like this capillary action, it's going to come up and be drawn up the leg and just rot out the feet. So good advice anytime, whether it's, whether it's uh, cypress or whatever, I like to saturate the ends of the legs with some epoxy just to seal those ends and then do whatever you're going to do. So that would help a wood that wasn't as weather, weather tough to survive. But um, so yes, you can, but you're really gonna have to stay on top of it and keep it well painted and try to get a good quality material because it can, it can rot, you know, without you realizing it. So looking forward, if you're looking forward to summer, you know, this is a great winter project, the end of winter, because it won't take you that long. Um, it's a lot of fun, and then you have something to show. You're going to have to make a pair of them, though, so you can sit there with your favorite person and uh, just enjoy the fruits of your labors. So, hey, if you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing as you will. And also, once again, check out epicwoodworking.com. I think you'll be really pleased with the kind of content you'll find over there to take your woodworking to another level sure and find some neighbors and friends to go on this journey with you. So thanks again for hanging out with the camera lady and myself <laughs> on behalf of her and me. We look forward to seeing you next time right back here on Shop Night Live. Good night, yes. everybody. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be with you. Have a great night.